Welcome to the final edition of our six month series called the Dana Discovery Dialogues, produced with support from the Dana Foundation. Today's topic is brain computer interfaces. This session is being recorded and will be available later on the Dana Foundation's digital platforms. The Dana Discovery Dialogues dig into the most compelling and relevant subjects in neuroscience highlighting how the latest research influences everything from our own personal decisions to how we deal with society's broader challenges. Today, we're going to take a closer look at brain-computer interfaces. These technologies take many forms. They might be implanted or external, and they could read signals, translate them, or both. Brain-computer interfaces offer real promise in treating and diagnosing neurological disorders or in converting thought to speech but they also have raised ethical concerns, and so the topic can sometimes be contentious. As these intriguing technologies enter clinical testing, how should the public think about brain-computer interfaces? Our expert panel today will provide an insightful overview about this growing field. Now, I'd like you to join me in welcoming our speakers, whom I'll name quickly, and then we'll come right back to them to learn a little bit more. Um, please say hello to Jennifer French of the Neurotech Network. Hello there, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Now, let's uh, welcome Karen Rommelfanger, Institute of Neuroethics, Think and Do Tank. Hi there, Karen. Hi, hello. And Adam Zali of the University of California at San Francisco. Hi there, Adam. Hi. So let's start off. Um, and to start off, I'd like to actually start from the beginning and ask each of our speakers to share a bit about themselves and how they're thinking about the topic of brain computer interfaces and what animates your passion in this area. Jennifer, could we start with you? Hi, yes, thanks for, for asking that question. Actually, my, I have a little bit of a different take for, for brain computer interfaces. I'm, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a neuroscientist um, uh, and, and I'm not a, a programmer, I'm a person with lived experience. So the frame of reference that I, approach this is from a community and a patient advocacy side, but also an industry side as well. So um, I can tell you a little bit about how those merged in, in creating a passion for this space. Um, I have been living with a neural prosthetic for 24 years. I have an implanted neural prosthetic that allows me to use my paralyzed limbs. That's right, I am paralyzed from a, a spinal cord injury. So I live with tetraplegia and uh, this, uh, technology allows me to um, have a lot more independence in my life and improve my health. So that's kind of where I do dovetailed into very an early poor lay into this, this uh, space uh, 24 years ago. It was a long time ago. Um, but also before that, I was in the tech industry, um, more so on the con consumer electronics. And as I started to learn about this space, it really started to see these two areas merge. And um, my passion for technology um, kind of merged with the passion for the, the neurotechnology of the space. And, um, and with that, over the years, I've not just worked with Neurotech Network, which is a nonprofit that focuses on education and advocacy of neurotechnology devices for people with neurological conditions, but also on the other side, work with industry and in helping a lot of the explosion of these small companies to uh, help them in terms of um, how their development, their business plans, uh, as well as helping them learn about the lived experience and connecting to for what we call community engagement today. So that's what creates my passion in this space. Thank you, Jennifer. Love to hear from Karen next. Hi, thank you for inviting me here and always uh, great to be amongst friends, uh, Jennifer and, and, and Adam. It's wonderful to be here and Marriott, thanks for bringing us all together. So I'm Karen Rommelfanger. I am the director of the Institute of Neuroethics Think and Do Tink, and we are a nonprofit that works with builders, decision makers and users to enable a world where we can be empowered by neuroscience. And, and that means everyone can be empowered. I started my journey as a neuroscientist, actually. So I was a bench neuroscientist for a long time. At the close of my, my bench science days, I was working on brain computer interfaces on deep brain stimulation. And from there, I was always seeking, you know, what, what brought me to that is 
I wanted to understand the organ from which I thought the mind emerged. So it seemed the brain seemed to be the most self-defining organ in human existence, and I wanted to understand it. And as I tried to more deeply understand it in the lab, I started to realize that there was more to understanding the brain than just looking at the cells at the smallest level. And what really was meaningful about the science was also how it was being translated into society and how it might fundamentally change how we who we are or how it might change how we think we operate in the world. And so that really led me into ethics. And from there, I, I delved down this path in this relatively new field, about 20 years old, called neuroethics. And I was uh, uh, directed a program there for a while, also working on understanding how neurotechnologies and neuroscience impacted the way we define disease and how we imagined wellness. And through my time at the university, I started working a lot in um, more policy circles and realizing that we needed to have broader voices in this conversation than just your university uh, expert and, and maybe even your policy expert so that we could find implementable real world solutions. And that's where the genesis of the think and do tank came from. So everyone here, including the audience are exactly the type of people I, I, I wanna be around and how I wanna be spending my day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Adam. Well, thanks for having me here today. It's always, as Karen said, fun to uh, um, do these panels with people you know and friends, and I'm happy to talk about this topic. It's one I think about a lot, and I approach from, I'd say, two main perspectives. Um, I'm a researcher, <clears throat> a scientist. I run a, a center at University of California, San Francisco in the neurology department. And so on one side, we do a lot of research into understanding how brains and computers interface, both usually non-invasively, but a little bit on the invasive side. And we could take some time to unpack that difference. Um, and then the other side, uh, the other main hat I wear is in technology development, where we create all sorts of brain computer interfaces, usually non-invasive ones. And I do that both uh, through my position as, as the director of Neuroscape, which is a research center at UCSF, so academic nonprofit group, but also as a co-founder of a company called Achille, where we build uh, therapeutic video games um, as a way of improving function um, outside, of, uh, outside of drugs as medicine. So I'm happy to break all that down and how I view that as a, uh, interfaces between uh, brains and computers. Thanks, Amelia and Adam. And I, I love all of the variety of perspectives that are coming to uh, the conversation today from, you know, how to how do we continue to push the understanding boundaries through discovery to ethical ramifications and how do we how do we work together to build a better future that we're we're all empowered to benefit from uh, neuroscience technologies to patient uh, understanding and advocacy. Each of these voices and perspectives is so important to making sure that together as society, we move together in a productive way. So let's let's start to tease um, these uh, areas apart a bit. And, you know, many, let, let's confess, you know, of course, many of us read the headlines and we think of devices in the headlines, but I understand so well from each of you that brain computer interfaces, and, and Adam, you were just touching on this, are, are so much more than implanted devices. So I, I think it'd be great to start with some definitions. Um, Karen, maybe maybe we could, you know, I, I know I know the term BCI or brain computer interface covers a lot of ground. I'd like to start with you and I'd love Adam and, and Jennifer to add their thoughts as well. Yeah, I would love Adam and Jen to, to add their thoughts too <laughs> because it's a, it is a tricky definition. I think I'll just describe neurotech uh, brain computer interfaces broadly from the ways I've, I've seen them being uh, discussed in the policy, uh, trans the uh, international policy landscape. And these are generally devices that can sense, that can decode and modulate um, brain activity and, uh, and the spine and spinal cord activity, so the nervous system. But these cover a lot of devices, as, as Adam mentioned, they can be uh, not implanted or they can be surgically implanted, as, as Jen will talk about with her, her lived experience. And I really think about BCIs as another shorthand for a brain-computer interface. I really think of, of BCIs actually as communication devices. They're a way to connect the brain to another technology. 
And the brain is, is um, a wonderful synthesizer of, of information that's communicated to it. It's also a great conveyor to the rest of the body. And usually, uh, off, often with catastrophic injury or disease, that communication, those communication lines are broken down. And so these technologies often offer a way to bypass broken systems or even augment systems that are, uh, that are working typically. So I'll, I'll throw that out there and let Adam and, and Jen, if, if that's okay, <laughs> take it from there. Yeah, may, maybe I'll jump in. Um, I agree with everything Karen said. It's always nice not going first and having to give the broadest definition. Um, <clears throat> I would like to expand it, though, um, and go broader in some ways. I, I get asked that question a lot, BCI, and I think what a lot of people mean by it is when they're saying that term is like direct BCI. Um, and a lot of the conversations, we go to a BCI conference and it's all like about implantables. And we're, we've just mentioned non-invasive uh, BCI, which is in, really important to talk about. But <clears throat> I like to sort of even broaden the conversation and say that um, key, keyboards and mouse, mouse and trackpads and touch screens are brain computer interfaces as well. Um, and, you know, when you think about just the term and without all the overlaid um, biases that might be attached with it, that it is about invasive, you know, that's what a keyboard and a trackpad is. It's an interface between your brain and the computer that you're using. And I think not considering those brain computer interface interfaces minimizes the impact that interacting with a computer with any device can have on your brain, which I think is a big problem. It has been a longstanding problem, um, you know, in, in, and Karen and I talk about this in neuroethics research, you know, a lot of it has been focused on the more invasive pills, things you put in your brain that, that change it. Um, but now you see a rise of discussions about social media and more about video games. I was on a panel last week about that. And you realize that all the interfaces between computers and brains can change the brain in a pretty profound way. And so I wouldn't want to trivialize the ways that most people interact with the computers as not using brain computer interfaces. Now, of course, there's an intermediary, it's not direct, you know, it goes from your brain to your motor system, to your fingers, to your trackpad, but it's still really an interface between your brain and the computer. So I like to think about it, the whole spectrum from the tools that everyone uses as a type of brain computer interface to non-invasive brain computer interfaces that are reading either neurophysiological signals or other physiological signals, and then directly uh, using that data uh, as an interface with you or the real implanted electrodes in the brain uh, interface. So I find it helpful to think about that full spectrum of, of BCI. Yeah, so if I could take some pieces that Karen and Adam had already mentioned um, and, and broaden this umbrella to about, you know, maybe the size of a golf umbrella, but, but let me just say we're just going to make it a little bit bigger. You know, these days we see and we hear about everything that interacts with the brain is considered a BCI. And I really tend to differ with that because the way that I think is, is a is a, is a way to think about the way that we interact with our brain or our brain interfaces overall. Um, and then we have this multi-level um, kind of classification of where we can start to define these brain interfaces. And that's how we can get to BCI. So let me just explain that. So when we think about implanted versus external. So those that are surgically implanted, and then we have those that are outside the body or external, as Adam had mentioned. Um, we're starting to hear bubbles about minimally invasive, but the reality of it is they still require a surgery and there's still some, they break through that skin barrier. So I would put them into one of those two buckets, um, whether they want to classify it as minimally invasive. We also want to look at the capabilities, as Karen mentioned, of a brain interface. So can it sense? Does it stimulate? Does Is it bi-directional? Does it sense and stimulate? or um, what we call closed loop or responsive. So that's another kind of way to, to look at the classifications of that. Also looking at the modalities and the use case. So um, how is it being used? Is it used for rehabilitation and therapeutics? Is it used as a prosthetic or a communication device? Is it used for diagnostics and analysis? Is it used for cognition and wellness? Um, or is it is it used for 
for a lot of different modalities and use cases. So that's another way to look at it and help to start to classify this down a little bit more. Also looking at the regulatory space, particularly if you're in medical, in the, the applications of whether it's uh, under an FDA, PMA, 510K clearance, or if it doesn't need any oversight because it isn't considered as a medical or making any medical claims. Um, I did mention applications. So there's applications in medical, in wellness, in sport, in education, in gaming, in art, um, entertainment, and, and employment. So there's a wide array of applications, if you will, for um, different types of brain interfaces. And just as a side note, keep in mind that a lot of these brain inter interfaces have their root history in the medical space. Um, so a lot of them, whether they've merged out into de different applications, whatever modality they might be, a lot of them have some type of root going back to um, the medical space. Uh, so how do we get to BCI, right? So the way that I look at BCI coming from all of those different kind of modalities and classifications is the traditional BCI can be either implanted or external. Um, it can be either or, but it has the capabilities of sensing activity from the brain. And its modality is primarily as a prosthetic or a communication um, device that we've seen so far in, in terms of communication and, and as a, a traditional BCI. Um, and a lot of it, as I mentioned earlier, is rooted in the medical space. Um, so that's kind of the, the bigger umbrella and a long definition of all of those different kind of classifications that we could look at brain interfaces to get to what the traditional BCI is. Um, and from a classification standpoint. Thanks a million, uh, everybody. And Jennifer, I'd like to stay with you for just, just a minute here and, and kind of springing off of something Adam said, which is regardless of the interfaces, actually what you said was all the interfaces can change the brain in a profound way or profound ways. And uh, I thought might be helpful, and you just started to touch on it, Jennifer, so that's why I'd like to stay with you for a minute on therapeutics and could you speak to us a little bit about what are some of the ways these interfaces and you you shared a really personal uh you know experience with us at the at the top of the uh, hour but what are what are some of the ways we're seeing uh potential therapeutics or now being used therapeutics um that would be great to to hear a little bit more about that yeah i mean from a brain interfaces perspective um from a therapeutic um a kind of put in rehabilitation and therapeutic into that when we're looking at, um, you know, in terms of thinking of mental health as a brain disease, um, how can we modulate the brain to help um, people living with different types of um, mental um, disorders of their brain to, to be able to modulate that brain activity or that neural activity? Um, for, for instance, those with PTSD or post-traumatic stress, how do we calm their anxiety using various types of, of um, of, of brain interfaces. We can also think about it of connecting it to um, a prosthetic where a prosthetic might be used for rehabilitation after a stroke. So for instance, we might use some type of signaling from the brain to be able to um, help rehabilitate an upper extremity from a paralyzed limb for people that live with hemiplegia from a stroke. So that might be another rehabilitation application. Adam can probably speak to this quite a bit from using it from you know a brain interface and using video gaming from a therapeutic standpoint. So I'm gonna softball this back over to him to talk a little bit about um, therapeutics as well. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Adam, you spoke to me about experiential medicine, and I think this might be <clears throat> that as well. Yeah, it's um, it's a term that I use to sort of distinguish from what many people think of as medicine reflexively, which is molecular medicine or pill-based medicine. And I mean, you ask some people just, you know, what what is medicine to you? They'll say a pill. It's just such a strong um, connection between those two things, but that's not true necessarily, right? Medicine doesn't require a pill to be medicine. Um, and how can we it change our bodies and our brains to improve our health when you have an impairing condition? I'd say any of those approaches would fall into medicine. And so I use this term experiential medicine to uh, capture the interventions that don't use a molecule that's delivered to you by a pill or an injection, 
but rather have you engage in some interaction. It could be passive, but often active in, in interaction that activates brain network selectively because that's what experiences do and then changes your brain because your brain has neuroplasticity. And so the, this term experiential medicine um, may be a new one, but the concept is an old one. I would say ancient practices like meditation and mindfulness um, were often directed at releasing and helping with mental, you know, health problems and stress and fear. And, you know, you could see all these terms written in ancient texts. And they were experiences that were delivered usually through a human expert, like a meditation leader. Um, and now <clears throat> what we have the opportunity to do is to deliver experiences, hopefully at scale, because it's so needed using technology. And so when you deliver an experience through technology, um, and you may be sensing brain data or physiological data, or at least performance data, and you drive in a, I think Jennifer mentioned closed loop, you drive a closed loop interaction, meaning that the challenges and rewards and stimulation are all updated in real time. And you create this flow of information from the brain to a processor, to a digital device, challenging you and rewarding you with a certain experience, you can get really meaningful changes in how the brain functions. And so I think of that as experiential medicine that's delivered through technology. And I would say brain computer interfaces fall very clearly in that domain. Aaron, any further thoughts on um, <clears throat> therapeutics that we maybe haven't touched on, especially I'm thinking about the ethical angles? Yeah, I, I just want to flag I really enjoyed hearing both Jen and, and Adam talk about you know these different angles of how these BCIs could could change life and even this interesting thing about what is the purpose of medicine. But we're also in a moment, and this kind of tangentially affects BCIs, but the really cool thing about the brain, one of the things that really excites me is it challenges our traditional notions of of medicine. Like the brain has really told us that, you can't look at the body or a human and think of it as a machine in the need of a mechanical fix, and that is going to fix everything. The brain has showed us just how complex our life experience is and the feedback loops that we engage in being an embodied and social human. And we are seeing this shift as with, with these kinds of technologies available to us, with these technologies even challenging, what does it mean to impact the mind by directly touching the brain or not? Um, you know, is health, are, are we still going to keep thinking about health as a state of, of an absence of injury, the absence of illness, or are we going to be trying to move towards health that is a state of you know, physical, mental, social well-being? And as we are designing these new technologies and, and the brain uh, and de designing devices that can now interface with the brain, maybe augment, maybe even scale, as Adam said, they're very you know, deep considerations for us to be collectively working together to imagine the type of health we are striving for. And intervening with the brain is going to be very different than thinking about intervening with the liver or the kidney. You know, this is something... <laughs> on a much grander scale, which is why it's really important to be collecting all these various perspectives and worldviews from people who are plugging into the technology. And not just that, you know, I, I think we need to be doing that beyond certain social and geographic circles. So I think we have to think about culture too. And, and it's a, as we think about this, and this is the last thing I'll say about it, is that health is and, and the way we conceive it and how we desire it is culturally informed just as much as the scientific questions we pursue and the ways we disseminate our scientific knowledge. So, uh, you know, we must take care in thinking about where a lot of these technology developments are happening geographically and who the users are going to be ultimately and how we're really thinking about just and fair ways not to just apply access, but to move towards futures that people will collectively want. And if I can, oh go ahead, go ahead. If I could just jump j jump in here real quick in terms of, you know, Karen makes a great point on the fact that we need to be very careful because technology is moving so fast today. But I think it's also important for your audience to understand that these brain interfaces and brain computer interfaces, when we think about it, have a long and rich history in science. So this isn't something that's just 
suddenly come up. It's just that our technology development is happening much quicker now. I mean, we could look back a hundred years ago and it was Hans Berger that, that used EEG on a human brain to understand brain activity. And there has been a plethora of scientific development over these decades as we've approached and, and, and we've looked into to doing first implants even back into the 1960s, 50s and 60s. And, you know, John Walpole, we have to give, you know, a, a credence to, he's from the, the, um, the Wadsworth Center in New York, who really developed this in this non-invasive EEG called the BCI 2000. Um, and that, that was way back when. And, um, and so we have a rich history of science that is supporting what we're seeing today, but also to, to give credit to the visions that we had back in 2013 with the Brain Initiative that really helped to push the development of um, neurotechnologies and our understanding of the brain. It was really kind of the human genome project at the time. And over these first decade of this um, initiatives taking place, we've seen the development of tools, we've seen first in humans, we're now seeing an explosion of companies, um, of, of devices being developed and translated out of the lab. So, um, when we we have to be careful on the development and how quickly it's coming now but i think it's good for us to understand that there's a history behind this and scientific base ground for the technology that we're developing today and and to, to take just a step too is that there is still a lot of science going on and there is still a lot that we don't know and as we start to parlay into more of the the social integration of these new technologies we have to take um credence to a lot of the ethical issues and need to address them now rather than punching them down the line. Um, I was going to make a, a comment off of sort of bridging something that both Karen and Jennifer talked about, which is the end user and the population. And that's like worthy of a long discussion in itself. Um, and, but I was, I, I think that one aspect of it that's worth mentioning is, you know, we keep going back to this um, aspect of BCI being invasive versus non-invasive and that they both have a role and they both have a history. But I think that some of the connection between the invasiveness and the population is worth commenting on. Um, <clears throat> clearly for invasive uh, BCIs, at least right now, those that involve surgery, even like the minimally invasive that still involve skin cutting, um, you, you sort of need to have a pretty good reason, I would say, to do these type of things. And um, there are lots of good reasons. Jennifer's own personal case probably being uh, one of the, the chief ones that I've seen BCI being applied. Um, but others like Parkinson's disease, where you have implant implantations for tremor, um, it, they exist. They're life changing. They're important. There's a lot of great work going on. But I think it's fair to say that they're not for everyone. It's not the type of uh, thing that you would do um, either on the medical side or on the personal side, even want to do without um, having real debilitation that needed correcting. And when we look at uh, less invasive approaches, like we have this video game that's therapeutic and now approved by the FDA to treat inattention and ADHD. So first time ever a video game uh, approved by the uh, FDA it was a 13 year journey, a long time, and, you know, offers parents an alternative beyond stimulants uh, for something, you know, that might be more in alignment with how they would want their children treated, but, you know, part of a larger uh, opportunity to treat kids. And we're, I'm super excited about that, but it also raises the question of, well, what about people that might not have ADHD, that might have attention that they think is subpar, sort of everyone feels that their attention is subpar. And here we have a non-invasive uh, treatment, which, you know, virtually no side effects or, you know, certainly not outside of the realm of what people are doing, you know, recreationally playing video games. And it raises some really interesting questions about do we expand the offerings beyond the clinical domain where we have targeted it as an FDA treatment? And we're excited because it makes it hopefully makes doctors open their minds to think about medicine more broadly of what they would prescribe to a 12 year old that has attention problems. But what about, you know, 16 year old that has no diagnosis, but is still developing their attention, wants to improve it. 
And that is, uh, I think, a really interesting conversation um, that Karen was sort of alluding to as well, when you're talking about non-invasive, low side effect, uh, BCIs and other types of digital treatments. How do we think about this, what has been often a very thick line between wellness, medicine, even education, all these things start breaking down a lot. And, you know, the, the challenges we have regulatory agencies, we have the FTC on one side for non um, medically regulated devices, the FDA on the other side, we have big institutions like the education institution over here, and the healthcare institution over here. And sometimes they create boundaries that shouldn't exist, especially when you have interventions that are not that dangerous. So I think it's a really interesting and, and complex discussion. I completely agree. Uh, Jennifer, did you want to say some more? You look like you had a, a thought. Okay. Yeah, that's an incredible point, Adam. And if I could just add to it as the non-invasive side adds this whole level of accessibility um, from an affordable standpoint, from um, from just a, an ability to to get to get to it, because you're right, you have to, the, those that are looking at the implanted or even the minimally invasive, they have to go through our healthcare system to be able just to access it and trying to do that is extremely difficult. Doesn't re, it doesn't matter what country you're in, but when we look at non-invasive, the accessibility of that into, um, you know, non-first world countries is amazing, and 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 it really takes away some of the, some not all, some of the socioeconomic barriers that exist as well. Um, but I think what Karen was alluding to too is that whether whether it's implanted or external, there's still these ethical issues that we're all having to face. Um, whether it's non-invasive, what do you do with my data? Who has access to it, um, and also how how are they going to be used in society? I know Karen is this is more of her expertise, but regardless, we still have a lot of those questions unanswered. Yeah, um, yeah, everyone's speaking my language here. I I, I love it. Um, I I wanted to add something that um, both both of you have inspired in me to comment on, if I may, and it's it's this. I want to be clear because as an ethicist on here, I think that the audience may expect, or, or if they were typical to many audiences, that uh, Karen is going to be the one who swoops in and and either is the police or or kind of saves us from all ill will of technology, and she sees it and she's going <laughs> to. And and I want to share here that, uh, and, and not that Jen and uh, Adam, you didn't inspire that you're doing that. I'm just saying that it reminded me that I was thinking about. Often it's important to remind everyone of the long history of, neuro, of neuroscience and neurotechnology because it, unfortunately, for better or worse, probably everyone has heard of Elon Musk and not in, in the best ways. And uh, you know, people think, oh, Elon Musk is the first one to create this certain technology, and oh my gosh, you know, and, and he's implanted these brain chips. Uh, you know, I don't know if this is a relief or not to audiences, but that's been being done for over 30 years, you know. So <laughs> that is. And it's been done quite responsibly and with deep consideration, uh, you know, and, and the, there are many global brain initiatives like the one in the US that Jen French mentioned, and they have a neuroethics group of, of which I'm a part, and we talk about these things deeply. Um, but I want to mention uh, another, another, if we want to call it a brain computer interface, we talk about how we scope it, but these are EEGs, electroencephalograms, or electroencephalography. These are electrodes that are pervasive around the globe in the clinic. They're stuck on the head usually with gel. There are these little patches and they can measure brain activity, mostly from the outer surface of the brain, but getting better so they can do deeper areas of the brain. And you know these have been around for over a hundred years and they're so uh, important clinically and diagnostically that they're even be used partially in thinking and making determinations of death. And they're used in making determinations partially for consciousness. And even in new models of that are discussed, I think in the the past uh, of these Dana discovery dialogues, and you should check out the one on on organoids, you know, even being used to detect new entities that we're creating with the brain and whether or not they have consciousness. So th those are very very critical uh, tools, and they are being modified for the con consumer domain. But I want to mention that even though they're 100 years old and used so pervasively, they to date are not optimized to detect brain activity from heads that grow coarse curly hair. And that's typical of people from, of African descent. And you wonder how does a technology that's gotten spread so far and wide with so much utility 
still not optimized for the global majority. So I think this is what I think about when I don't think I know this is what I'm, I'm thinking about when I see very exciting rapid developments in technology, brain computer interfaces, however we scope them, and how they're ultimately going to be made available and how they're going to be interpreted when they only work for some. And we have a history of this, right? Thank you for that. Oh, the, other, the other thing, sorry, just close with that in addition to the clinical aspect, to what, what Adam inspired was that this porousness of medical to non medical is only going to become more uh, increasingly complicated. And this is why policy entities have a really hard time figuring what to do. So thank you all so much for just an amazing uh, conversation so far, giving us a scope of what brain commuter, uh, computer interfaces are, could do, are suggesting, are helping us sort of probe additional areas and, and most of all, how, how we still have a lot to sort out. And, and I'd actually like to continue along those lines of the, you know, the a lot to sort out and why they're they're challenging, but taking a little look ahead. And by the way, audience, I see your questions starting to come in and I promise you we'll start to come to you very soon. I just thought it would be helpful to illuminate this, this area of the conversation just a little bit before we do that. So, you know, as we're looking ahead at, at, at technologies, Karen, I'm, I think I'm going to just start with you for a minute. You know, what should, what should policy leaders be thinking about in this moment? I mean, you mentioned in our earlier conversation, an example of a, a tricky example of a, a well-meaning law in, in Chile, for instance. Um, maybe you could start us off there, and then I have a couple of other questions. Yeah, there is a very uh, vibrant and excited conversation uh, around the globe happening around um, the idea that maybe even new human rights need to be developed around neurotechnologies, around brain technologies, and BCI would be one of them. And these groups are are very concerned about one, something that's very kind of prominent to all of us. We all know, think about data privacy these days. We have so many devices that are connected. We'd be probably worried about privacy when you logged on to Zoom and there was probably some kind of indication that we're collecting XYZ but won't sell it to XYZ. So data privacy is always a concern. But when it's brain data, there is a question of if that is different in degree and kind enough that warrants special kinds of protections. And you might you know, intuitively, and, and and frankly, whether it's really different or not, socially, if we believe brain data is different, then it then it legally can be different. <laughs> so it's it's not up to the technologist to say say what it is. Um, but you you might imagine that if the brain is the most if you agree and you don't have to that that the brain is one of the most self defining organs in human existence, then any data that you might acquire from it might be very personal, might feel personal and sensitive and special. Um, you know, and I think people are developing these devices might say, well, that that data is actually just a bunch of it's it's raw numbers. It means it means nothing until we interpret it. Um, and right now we can't really interpret that much from it, some might say, but we can talk about that. But the challenge is that in this era where we have multiple kinds of data that are combined and brain computer interfaces and neurotechnologies broadly, brain technologies are paradigmatic of what we call converging technologies, meaning that they're enabled and empowered by AI. They work with advances in computer science. They work with engineering. There is all kinds of data, all kinds of devices coming together to make these work so that you can start to imagine that there's going to be new kinds of data that we haven't even prepared for before. And that, and that is actually really exciting. That is exciting, but it's hard to prepare for and understand how, how revealing is that going to be, et cetera. And then there are other, there's, so that's kind of the data camp. And then there's this other camp of, if you're uh, recording from my brain, actually, if you're changing my brain, might you be changing my right? Might you be changing my identity? Am I still the author of my own life? What rights do I have to that? And um, you know, might might someone else be able to uh, intervene in my right to have a continuous psychic continuity? Is, is what some have said. And um, 
you know, and, and that's kind of a tricky one because if you're a, a scientist, you know that even having this conversation now or even being a viewer of this right now is changing your brain at this moment. And this kind of goes to Adam's point about what, what is a brain computer interface? Um, so really concerned about this conversation through some strong advocacy of lobbying groups in Chile at this moment where they were changing their, they were in a moment of changing their constitution, they amended their constitution to include special protections for brain data, for this idea of mental integrity, that is that your, your mind, you, you, you can have control of what's in your, in your mental, uh, uh, your mental box, I suppose, whether it's your brain or not, and that others can't intervene with it. Um, and so in that they specifically initial drafts called for psychic continuity, right, psychic continuity, and um, you know, mental integrity and protection of these things. However, and, and ultimately the amendment passed after several iterations, but you might think, and, and this was celebrated around the world as, as a, a success story, you know, pioneer in, in rights. However, what was interesting was that local digital rights advocacy groups and also physicians were really clamored to talk about, about their concerns related to the amendment because it did too little and too much at the same time by not really uh, specifying what they meant by brain data or, or psychic continuity, et cetera. It actually couldn't offer substantive implementable protection. On the other hand, it did too much for physicians because that meant that even standards of care today wouldn't be allowed, right? So. If you go to receive psychotherapy, is that changing your mental continuity? Is that changing your trajectory? So by, by those kind of interpretations, those things that we, we know to be good right now wouldn't work. So the, the ultimate take home from that was that this well-meaning uh, legal change was done with, again, well-meaning policymakers and bench scientists who didn't actually have experience with technology in in the wild <laughs> that is in the real world uh, and also didn't ask people who actually use those technologies their perspectives on them so you're creating rights for people without asking them or engaging them in the conversation and for that reason we've learned a lot from that that law and the types of ways we need to be having these conversations about data privacy about what it means to intervene with the self and, and then there's more but that i think i'll stop there because it's a lot to take in probably I think in the interest of time, <laughs> pardon me for that, uh, I see a few questions and then I, I, I have some others. And if, if there's if there's time for me to come back, I'll, I'll come back and ask a couple of those, but I'd like to give the audience a, a chance. Uh, so here's a, a question from uh, one of our guests. How, how do you believe a media portrayal of BCI could be correctly approached for the right communication with the general public? And... Um, well, there's two parts to that question. So let's just take that first part and see how we go. Um, not to be a riff on the media, um, but I think we live in sound bites and this technology is not easily explained in a headline. Um, and, and, and that, that concerns me um, on, on how we communicate this out and how we help to educate the public so that we don't induce fear, but we um, also don't induce shallow excitement either. I think it, it's very important that the media plays a role on educating, not on trying to, to sell a soundbite or get a click. Um, so, so I think the media does play a role in public education. And I think part of it is, is partnering um, to, to help educate those who are writers out in the public. I mean, that's part of um, if, if I can go into a little bit about one of the things I'm excited about is we, uh, just a few weeks ago, we launched the Implantable BCI Collaborative Community. And part of that, part of our, our working group in this collaborative effort is bringing in multi-stakeholders. And one of our real, of the of seven main efforts that we're going after is really understanding public education and messaging around BCIs. Because that's incredibly important on how we shape our laws, how we shape our social narrative around um, uh, BCIs, and this one specifically focused on implantables, but regardless, bringing in multi-stakeholders to solve shared problems 
uh, are the way that we can do it instead of uh, tossing it off over the fence to to media or tossing it off over the fence to a researcher to talk about it. Um, so that's, I think, something that I'm very excited about, but I think that's part of the efforts that we need to do as those that are in this space to be able to work with our partners in the media to be able to help educate the public. Um, so I think it plays a, an, an incredible role um, as we go forward in, in addressing especially some of these social, economic, and cultural issues. And the related question, which I think actually builds on the, the point, Jennifer, you were making about the collaborative, and, and I don't know, maybe, uh, Adam, you might have some suggestions here too, is um, a question that you know many, many researchers talk about BCI and neurotech, uh, around low-income countries, but barely we, we barely see people from those countries involved in that research or Congress or presentations. Are there thoughts we might have about how to uh, how to address that? What can we do about that? Well, I don't I don't know how well I can answer part of that question, but the um, maybe to riff a little bit off of Jennifer's answer, which may connect it, is that. When, when researchers talk about this or scientists or physicians or people in the advocacy community, they will almost invariably emphasize the incredible need that we have or and people have in the world for solutions. People that are just not currently served by treatments that leave them, you know, incredibly debilitated. And when you lead with that, then it really shapes a conversation from like a media perspective and you know i think on the global level too of wow there's just so much suffering we need to do a lot better this is really innovative and although it's complicated tell me more as opposed to what the media would like to do which is to lead with like the cyborg image which starts like very sensational very headline grabbing especially if elon musk is involved but it really sets the wrong i think tone for the conversation about PCI and what what it's you know what it can do because it plants all these images in people's minds which certainly grab their attention and get them to read an article but it's not how people in the community tend to lead and, and talk about this and think about this which is much more on the side of people need help badly and we have not served so many in in need around the world so that's how i like always begin conversations with media is starting with the need driving this rather than here's some cool tech or some very science fictiony sounding stuff that's going to be really sensational and start with the need that people face so that that's just my own personal preference of when i uh, interact with the medium, always emphasizing that as, as a starting point. And I think it really helps set a tone for the public to receive it a lot better than the other way around. Because then you're like, oh, we're creating monsters or cyborgs. You know, it's like, that's not happening. <laughs> it's not for a lot. Who knows when that's going to happen? We have a lot of people to help in the meanwhile. And I think at the global level, you know, I, th you know, I think that, it, you know, it's the same type of messaging that we want to have. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I think you're so lucky to have scientists like Adam who can speak so clearly about this and someone like Jen who has so a breadth of experience, including her lived experience, but most scientists don't have that, right, Adam? I mean, so, I mean, the, the, the challenge is, so, so I, I know we like to talk about the media, but the media is like not really a monolith, right? It's, it's a bunch of different players and frankly, you know, the, the media offices of universities sometimes are to blame for, for a lot of this. I just saw a, a media office from the university put out something with the headline mind reading when the scientist explicitly says in the interview, don't use that term. <laughs> so, I mean, there, so one thing I think is that the scientists need to be prepared. They need, it is no secret what is going to be, when it comes to BCI, what is gonna be in the popular imagination. <laughs> you know, uh, we just, it's no secret. So you've got to be ready to, as a scientist, I think, to know what those hot button words are. And I know at NIH at Brain Initiative, when we had a, a, a particularly an issue come out where we knew was going to draw a lot of media attention, uh, media attention there was a, a proactive effort to scout out what those words were that were going to trigger things and try to help the writers uh, have, have a collective information on this. The second is that uh, a lot of these short form authors that we have right now, 
um, you know, that's mostly it's 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 so nice if you can go to the Atlantic or the New York Times or whatever. Most writers don't have that luxury. They're freelance. They're not specialists. So one idea that has been put out there that I really like is to try to create a community where you're educating actually the writers. It, I, I think actually, Mariette, you were talking about this in, in advance um, so that they're aware of the latest. So when stories like this come up, they have a readiness and maybe they have a pool of trusted scientists. Um, and I think that the third thing I would just add is to, to really, um, you can start with the, the great need and, and that's always so important to, to emphasize, but also I think you have to be very, uh, as head on uh, address the issues that people are going to blow out of proportion or unrealistically speak about. I think you just have to proactively say, just like the, the scientist I was mentioning earlier said, this is not mind reading and let me tell you why. So I think there's there's a, a bit of this where we can't be afraid. We, we know what that social narrative that's out there. We know the dystopian future. You know, you just need to kind of address that head on. And as you know, a prominent writer told me once, you know, the ethics issues, those are the things that people care about even more than the science. They want to know what it means. So you've gotta you've gotta face those. So um I'd love to ask this. I, I think we're we're running we're starting to run short on time, so I'm going to have to ask us to wrap up shortly. But I do want to share one more audience question because we're we hear a lot about uh, brain computer interfaces, and we're also and we touched on this earlier. We're also hearing a lot about AI, and there's a, a question in the uh, from our audience about what what's what's your collective opinion on this boom of AI combined with brain computer inter interfaces. Uh, how how will that influence the picture going forward? I'm happy to jump oh, in, okay. Adam. Okay, uh, I think, um, and actually, there was just a conversation at National Academies on this yesterday. Um, but I, but I think part of AI is extremely exciting. BCIs are extremely exciting, but we both have to put our we have to put both modalities forward with caution and with care. Um, and I think when we think about BCIs and the data that we can get out, we can use that as a tool and we can use AI as a tool to help develop um, um, BCIs in a very thoughtful and very um, collaborative way. Let me just give you an example. When we think about using AI, right now we have something called closed loop systems. So we have something that detects seizures in the brain. We have closed loop DBS. We have closed loop spinal cord stimulation for, for, for pain. And that is only taking some individual data and, and modulating the treatment to improve the treatment for that specific person. When we start to think about using larger data sets, it's much more difficult to do that. That's where AI can be an incredible tool in the space to help understand the data, differentiate it, and really output some therapeutic effects that can be uh, really uh, different from what we see today. But I think on the same sense, we have to have responsible development. And Adam touched on this earlier. And I think if we don't have a, have a, a level here in terms of community engagement in the development of both technologies, we will end up failing. So, um, so I think there's there's a responsible development, but we also have to think about engaging the community as well. Adam. Yeah, I mean, you basically said everything I was going to say, which is perfect, and it makes it easy for me. I I just add one thing, um, a perspective that, you know, I'm, I'm curious what, what Karen's uh, response to this is, but I would say. You know the tools themselves don't really have an ethical framework uh they can be cut both ways very easily um and that's always been the case i always say you know fire could burn your house down or cook your dinner um, a molecule could be thought of as medicine or poison depending on how you use it and you know the more powerful the tool the more uh responsible we need to be um, the earlier we need to be on thinking about it, the more monitoring we need to do. And AI, BCI, immersive environments, these are all good examples of powerful tools. And they can cut both ways. They, and if they're used not even intentionally, like by evil you know, overlords, uh, but just in a negligent way and not careful way, then they can be incredibly destructive. So as we move into more powerful tools, 
we just have to keep having these very thoughtful discussions about how we protect ourselves, how we develop with intention, and how we monitor for effects that we might not have had the insight to know that we were going to have. Um, you know, it just mean you know it doesn't end after development and commercialization. You have to always be monitoring. You know, we we could have done so much better with technology we thought was only going to help connect people. And now we're like, ooh, there's a lot more there. And, you know, it's okay that we didn't predict it all. Maybe it's not perfect that we didn't, but we could be monitoring better. We could have been monitoring better for all the things that we've created. And I hope we do a lot better with AI and BCI and also all the immersive technologies that are coming out too. Thank you. We have three minutes left uh, and I'm committing the sin of asking you to do what we've been talking about not doing. <laughs> which is to say, it, you know, and Adam, maybe maybe for you, maybe you feel like you've done this already, but I, I want to give Jennifer and, and uh, Karen the chance as well. Is, is there any final thought, you know, one thing you would really like people to take away from today's conversation? Um, I would love to invite you to share any final thoughts. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that with um, a lot of people worry that with you know, social media and AI, oh my gosh, it's too late. We can't recover from that. Uh, it's it's too pervasive. I, whether that's true or not, I, I really think with neurotechnology, we're, we're early enough. We're not, we're not that early, but we're early enough so that we can still guide this path. And I think the way to do that, an, an ethical path forward, is really a, an ethics by design approach that is co-creative with communities of people who are going to be using the technology with lived experience with people who are developers and designers and also with policymakers in mind. And if you integrate that into the design up front, you don't have to be slowed down in the end or even undermined totally with a technology that could otherwise really have helped people. So a collective ethics by design approach is what I would act, um, advocate for. Thank you. I th thanks. I think my... I would love to have people take away the fact that we are living in a very exciting time of development, a transformative time of development, and we can be move forward um, very from from a very enthusiastic standpoint, but we should also do so with caution, which I think has been expressed in this webinar. Um, one of our most recent initiatives I started, I, I touched on it earlier, was the implantable BCI collaborative community that we recently launched. And I think the the whole premise around this, which I think is some of the approaches that we've talked about today is the way that we bring in diverse communities, diverse stakeholders together to help with development. So it's not just those in the, the medical space or those that are that are clinicians or those that are researchers or those that are in industry or even those that are in agencies that are trying to figure out how to regulate these things or pass laws, but doing this in a very collaborative way, I think it's the, the way forward for us to help solve a lot of these problems. And it, yes, it takes longer, but the reality of the end result can be so much better. So I think we have to really think about collaborating and bringing diverse voices into the room um, and, and diverse perspectives can help us with thoughtful development. Thank you. I think that's a great note to end on. I want to just remind our, our folks, or, or if you joined us a little later, that the recording of today's discussion will be available on the Dana Foundation's platforms not long after this. We, we heard that it's exciting times in the world of brain computer interfaces. It's, these are powerful tools that can cut both ways that we need to engage with ethics by intent and that a great approach forward as Kara, as uh, Jen was just saying is, is for us to be, and we all were just saying, to be collaborative and inclusive as we discuss as a society together, how we wanna take these technologies fo uh, forward. I hope you'll join me in thanking our speakers very much for a really insightful and wonderful conversation. And uh, you know, take care everybody and thanks again 